Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're addressing the various parables of Jesus, which are contained in the Gospels. And this week, the parable of the budding fig tree, from all of the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. While the parable itself is short, it's incomplete without its proper context, and unlike most of the parables of Jesus, which mainly have to do with moral teachings or the nature of God's kingdom, this parable specifically is about recognizing the signs that God provides us with to anticipate things that are about to happen. Let's see. And from the fig tree learn a parable. When the branch thereof is now tender, and the leaves come forth, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see all these things, know ye that it is nigh, even at the doors. Matthew twenty four thirty two to 33 Now of the fig tree learn ye a parable. When the branch thereof is now tender, and the leaves are come forth, you know that summer is very near. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know ye that it is very nigh, even at the doors. Mark thirteen twenty eight to 29 And he spoke to them in a similitude. See the fig tree, and all the trees, when they now shoot forth their fruit, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Luke 21, 29-31 If all we had to go by was the parable itself, only Luke would reveal what Jesus means when he says, It is at hand. He's saying that people can tell when summer is approaching by the way a fig tree looks. In the same way, they can tell when the kingdom of God is approaching by various signs. He says this in response to a question by his disciples. He tells them that not one stone of the temple in Jerusalem will be left on top of another, and they ask him, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the consummation of the world? Matthew 24, 3b As we can see, this is actually two questions asked at once. The disciples ask them together because they assume that the destruction of the Jerusalem temple will be at the end of the world. However, we know that's not true. The temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and the end of the world still hasn't happened yet. Clearly, these are two different events that the disciples are asking about. They don't realize how mixed up it is to ask both questions at once, but Jesus would have. And much of what he says from Matthew 24, 4-31 is ambiguous because of it. Some of it sounds like it could be a vague description of the siege at Jerusalem. When therefore you shall see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, he that readeth, let him understand. Then they that are in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. And he that is on the housetop, let him not come down to take any thing out of his house. And he that is in the field, let him not go back to take his coat. And woe to them that are with child and that give suck in those days. Matthew twenty four fifteen to 19 He's saying that people should flee from the city of Jerusalem in that time. If you're on top of a house, don't come down because you're safer up there, and don't come to the besieged city if you're out in the field. The remark about children is especially painful, because the siege of Jerusalem involved the Roman army intentionally starving the inhabitants of the city until some of the people there allegedly cannibalized their own young out of madness. It was much more brutal than any mere battle. Other parts of Jesus' reply to the disciples are warnings that they not be led astray by false prophets claiming to be him or saying that he was arriving. He predicts many things about the end as well. And then shall many be scandalized, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall seduce many. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. But he that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations. And then shall the consummation come. Matthew 24, 10-14 There's more, of course, and I think it's curious that each of the first three gospels includes a version of this reply, but this is the overall context in which Jesus speaks of the blooming fig tree. His coming will be heralded by many signs, and so is the destruction of Jerusalem. We should do our best to watch out for signs like these so that we know what to do in order to preserve ourselves, and especially our faith, from being overrun by these kinds of troubles if and when they happen in our lives. 
However, ultimately, the reliability and unchanging nature of God can provide us with a hope of salvation even in the worst situations, so long as we remain faithful. Watch ye, therefore, praying at all times that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are to come, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21.36 If you want to read more about this, almost all of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are about this particular answer, and there's still tons of meaning in it that isn't fully understood. It's a great opportunity for future study. Next, the barren fig tree. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.